Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we're going to be focusing on Chapter 8, looking at treatments for depressive and bipolar disorders. When we think about treatment for depressive and bipolar disorders, it's important for us to first remember and note that around half of the persons who have unipolar depression, whether that's major depressive disorder or dysthymic disorder, receive treatment from a mental health professional each year, which means that about half do not. Access to treatment will differ among various ethnic and racial groups. Many people in therapy experience depressed feelings as part of another disorder. And when we think about therapy, the treatment is primarily focused on unipolar depression. However, many of the treatments for unipolar depression can also be used for bipolar and other depressive disorders. Now let's look at some treatments for unipolar depression. So let's first look at psychodynamic therapy. In psychodynamic therapy, therapists believe that depression results from unconscious grief over real or imagined losses. And this is often compounded by excessive dependence on other people, including the person who was in fact, um, you know, who has in fact died or is no longer there. Psychodynamic therapists expect that in the course of treatment, depressed clients will eventually gain awareness of the losses in their lives, become less dependent on others, cope with losses more effectively, and make corresponding changes in their functioning. So how do they do this? Well, they bring these issues into the consciousness and work through them. The first thing they do is free association, which is where they will help the client to associate the person or situation to something that is another similar event in their life, or they will uh, have that person that they're thinking of or that situation that is causing them to experience the grief and put it onto the therapist, work through it with the therapist, and then be able to have a new association with that grief or sadness. Psychodynamic therapists also offer their own interpretation, meaning that they will interpret what their understanding is of the situation in order to help the client to gain new awareness and understanding. There's also a thorough review of past events and feelings. So what are the strengths and limitations of the psychodynamic approach? Well, the strengths include that there are a number of successful case reports and case studies. It's often going to be most successful with moderately um, to from mild to moderate depressed clients who have a clear history of abuse, typically substance use um, types of abuse or substance use disorders. And long-term therapy is only occasionally helpful in unipolar depression cases. What are some of the limitations? Well, for many depressed clients, they're often too passive or they're too tired to fully participate. So they yes their therapist to death or they'll tell the therapist what they think they wanna hear rather than being honest. Clients may also become discouraged and end treatment too early because they're not seeing changes fast enough. So this figure, figure 8.1 from our text looks at how do people feel about depression and treatment? Well, for many, they believe that depression is a serious medical condition that requires treatment, but yet less than half actually receive treatment. So I encourage you to take a look at this figure and when you're ready, you can continue on. Also note that according to a survey from the National Alliance of Mental Illness, that more than 80% of Americans believe that depression is a serious condition, right? 19% consider depression to be a sign of a personal weakness. So overall, there is less of an emphasis on it being something wrong with you and more of an understanding that there is something wrong with, um, or that there's something really challenging the client where they are struggling with their depression. I'd also be interested, as many of you may be interested in seeing how the pandemic impacts depression with future studies. So one of the most commonly used treatment modalities for depression is cognitive behavioral therapy. So cognitive behavioral therapists typically will combine behavioral and cognitive techniques to help clients who are being impacted by depression. On the behavioral side, they seek to get the clients moving again to engage in and enjoy more activities. 
on the cognitive side, they guide the clients to think in more adaptive and less negative ways. The behavioral techniques seem to be of only limited help when just one of them is applied. So when you are using two or more techniques and they're combined, the behavioral treatment seems to reduce depressive symptoms, especially if they are mild. Oh, the most commonly used model of cognitive behavioral therapy is CBT, which was uh, developed by Aaron Beck. And in his cognitive therapy, he helps to guide clients in four different phases to recognize and change these negative cognitive and thought processes. The first is by increasing activities and elevating mood. The next is to challenge automatic thoughts. Next is identifying negative thinking and biases, also known as cognitive distortions. And finally, changing primary attitudes. So under Beck's cognitive behavioral therapy, he viewed unipolar depression as resulting from this pattern of negative thinking that may be triggered by current upsetting situations. And this approach is very similar to Albert Ellis's rational emotive therapy. What Beck says is that these maladaptive attitudes lead people into a cognitive triad. They repeatedly view oneself negatively, they repeatedly view the world negatively, and they repeatedly view the future negatively. So overall, when we are looking at those who receive therapies versus those who don't, about 50 to 60% show significant improvement in the elimination of their symptoms after experiencing therapy. And what we see here are different disorders for depressive and bipolar disorder, what the treatment is in the second column, the average duration of treatment in the third column, and the percent that can be approved, improved by treatment. And what you see is that by being in therapy, that more than half, almost two thirds of individuals are able to alleviate some of these symptoms and be closer to living the life that they love. When we think about CBT, of course, there's a lot of people who are going to take this and build upon it or make um, differences that can help those based on research. These new wave cognitive behavioral therapists tend to disagree with Beck's proposition about the need to fully discard negative conditions, excuse me, cognitions, to overcome depression. And they do this by incorporating mindfulness and other techniques to help the client recognize these negative cognitions and these streams of thinking to help start making those shifts. A lot of this is based on the fact that there's been research that suggests that approaches of this kind, incorporating mindfulness and incorporating other alternative and complementary treatments can be particularly useful as ongoing procedures to help prevent recurrences of depression once the individuals recover from an episode. So now let's take a look at multicultural treatments. A lot of multicultural treatments are going to be based on culture specific um, therapies. And a lot of this is based on culture sensitivity. These approaches increasingly are being combined with traditional forms of psychotherapy to help maximize the likelihood of minority clients overcoming these disorders. There is special training about different cultural values, attitudes, beliefs, norms, and stressors. And by having these specialized trainings, we can fully understand the needs of a specific minority group or subgroup so that they can receive the best treatment possible. Because again, when we think about treatment, there's no one size fits all. There's also family social treatment. When we think about this, a lot of where this comes from is from sociocultural theories, right? Sociocultural theorists trace the causes of unipolar depression to the broader social structure in which people live and the roles that they are required to play. So a lot of what they will do in family social treatments is interpersonal psychotherapy. And they start assessing the different losses, role disputes, role transitions, and deficits that may lead an individual or a group of individuals to become depressed. And it can help to look at how social conflicts or different role changes can lead to that depression. 
there are studies that suggest that interpersonal psychotherapy is as effective as cognitive therapy for treating depression because you're understanding a particular group's values, attitudes, beliefs, norms, and stressors. You're assessing the losses, the role disputes, the role transitions, and the deficits to fully understand what the needs are of that particular group. And you're also offering another layer of validation, which goes a long way with someone who's experiencing depression. There's also couple therapy. This is where you are working with two people who share in a long-term relationship to understand what the systems are that are coming into play within couples therapy, and also how they are developing or barriers in developing their own system. Also in couples therapy, you also assess the individuals themselves. So you look at each individual, you look at their system and the systems that impact each one of those individuals to help them to navigate into a union as a couple that will be best for them. A lot of what we do in couples therapy is integrative behavioral couples therapy. And this is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. And it also incorporates sociocultural techniques to help the couple understand different communication and problem solving techniques. The most common issues that come to couples therapy are money or finances, the, um, the lack of typically sex or anything intimacy related, and any kind of infidelity or stepping outside of the relationship without mutual consent. So in integrative behavioral couples therapy, we look at how a couple can communicate more effectively and how they can start critically evaluating the relationship in a compassionate way, identify problems and come up with problem solving techniques. IBCT is more effective than other techniques when one couple member is depressed because it can help overall enhance marital satisfaction. Remember within the couple, if one person is depressed, it impacts that whole system, not just that individual. If the marriage is filled with conflict, it can be as effective as other therapies for reducing the depression as a result of conflict. And one of the things that happens in couples therapy is that people learn how to engage in conflict in a meaningful way that doesn't do things, for example, like hit below the belt with insults. There's also a biological approach that we need to talk about, which are antidepressant drugs. So these have been around, have been around since the 1950s. And since the 1950s, there were two types of drugs that were found to reduce the symptoms of depression. That was MAOI or monoamine oxidase inhibitors and tricyclics. And these drugs have been joined in recent years by the second generation of antidepressants, which is what we see here. So the first two columns are the monamine oxidase inhibitors, they're the MAOIs. The generic name is in the first column and the trade name or the brand name is in the second column. Tricyclics are in the next two columns, generic and trade, left to right. And then we have the second generation antidepressants. And these are the most commonly used um, antidepressants that are used today, these second generation antidepressants. So how does an MAOI inhibitor actually work? Well, typically um, MAOIs break down norepinephrine and the inhibitors actually, so I should flip that back for just a second. So when we look at the MAO, right? The monamine oxidase breaks down norepinephrine. So what the inhibitor does is stops this breakdown from occurring. This typically will lead to a rise in norepinephrine activity and reduce depressive symptoms. When people who take monoamine oxidase inhibitors eat foods that contain the chemical triamine, this is things like cheese, bananas, and wine, their blood pressure may actually rise to a dangerous level. So it's important to look at someone's diet as they are taking MAOIs. So when we look at tricyclics, a couple of things to think about. In searching for medications to treat schizophrenia, researchers actually discovered that imiprene relieved depressive symptoms. Imiprene and related drugs are known as tricyclics because they share a three ring molecular structure. So most people who do end up taking tricyclics find because it acts on neurotransmitter reuptake mechanisms of key neurons, and it helps to block 
this overly vigorous reuptake process to allow serotonin and norepinephrine to remain in the synapses, they find that when they stop taking tricyclics, that they typically will have a depressive relapse symptoms within a year. Patients who take tricyclics for five additional months as part of continuation therapy have a significantly decreased risk of a relapse. Clients who take antidepressant drugs for three or more years after initial improvement, this is called maintenance therapy, may reduce the risk of a relapse even more. So tricyclics are believed to reduce the depression by affecting neurotransmitter reuptake mechanisms, as I just talked about. So in order to prevent a neurotransmitter from remaining in the synapse too long, there's a pump-like mechanism that recaptures the neurotransmitter and draws it back into the presynaptic neuron. The reuptake process appears to be too efficient in some people, drawing in too much of the neurotransmitter from the synapse. The reduction in the neurotransmitter activity in the synapse is thought to result in clinical depression. So tricyclics, again, will block this reuptake process, thereby increasing neurotransmitter activity, specifically around serotonin and norepinephrine. Um, they allow this um, activity or increase this activity in the synapse. So what you see here in figure 8.3 is the treatment for unipolar depression. So on the left, follow along with me, soon after a neuron releases neurotransmitters like norepinephrine or serotonin into the synaptic space, it activates that pump-like reuptake mechanism to reabsorb excess neurotransmitters. In depression, however, this reuptake process is way too active, removing too many neurotransmitters before they can bind to a receiving neuron. When you look on the right, this is where we look at tricyclic and most second generation antidepressant drugs. They block the reuptake process, enabling norepinephrine or serotonin to remain in the synapse longer and bind to the receiving neuron. Second generation antidepressants are actually a third group of effective antidepressant drugs that are structurally different from MAOIs and tricyclics. So we have three different types. There are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, also known as SSRIs. They increase serotonin activity, and specifically, no other neurotransmitters are affected. So this is going to include things like fluxetine or Prozac, uh, uh, Zoloft, and Lexapro. You also have selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors and serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. When we look at the um, effectiveness and we look at the speed of action, these drugs are on par with the tricyclics, yet their sales have skyrocketed. Clinicians often prefer these second generation antidepressants because it's harder to overdose on them than any other kinds of antidepressants. With second generation antidepressants, there's also no dietary restrictions like they have with MAOIs and they have fewer side effects than tricyclics. The undesired effects that typically happen often will include um, other aspects of their life. So for example, the most common side effect of second generation antidepressants are a reduction in libido or sex drive. So how effective are antidepressants really? Well, depending on what publication you use, there may be bias who will find that they're more or less um, effective. Something to note is that there are going to be similar trends whenever there are publications that are published. What we do know is that there are people who report that they have seen a reduction in depressive symptoms and the depressive symptoms based on their interpretation and especially in their feedback from their therapist can be attributed to the medication in addition to treatment. Now we have brain stimulation. So biological treatments typically will bring greater relief to people who have unipolar depression, right? So when we look at biological treatments, these typically mean antidepressive drugs, but for those who are severely depressed, who don't respond to other forms of treatment, it may sometimes include different brain stimulation, like electroconvulsive therapy or brain stim. Researchers surmise they might be able to stimulate the brains of individuals with depression by electrically stimulating the vagus nerve, 
through the use of a pulse generator implanted under the skin of the chest. This procedure brings significant relief to as much as 40% of those persons with treatment resistant depression. As with electroconvulsive therapy, researchers don't know yet precisely why this technique reduces depression. So when we look at ECT, ECT is where you put electrodes around a person's brain. And um, when you are, you then, it typically is done, let me step back. So under ECT, it's a procedure that's done under general anesthesia. You put these small electrodes on someone's brain and a doctor will send small electric current through the brain. They will intentionally trigger a brief seizure and it actually causes the brain chemistry to change and can quickly reverse symptoms of certain mental health conditions. So ECT is really great for major depression and even bipolar disorder and for those who haven't responded to other treatment. When we look at vagus nerve stimulation, I just kind of talked about that. When we are looking at um, transcranial magnetic stimulation, this is essentially a non-invasive procedure that uses magnetic fields to stimulate nerve cells in the brain to improve symptoms of depression. And it's typically used again when nothing else has worked. Here's just a little bit of ECT today. It's used frequently because it's an effective and fast acting intervention. The techniques for administering ECT have changed significantly since the treatment's early days. Again, patients are given drugs to put them to sleep so they're put under general anesthesia. They also receive muscle relax relaxants to prevent severe jerks of the body and broken bones. And they are also given oxygen to guard against any kind of brain damage. The discovery of ECT's effectiveness was accidental and was based on a link between psychosis and epilepsy. And it's been modified. They used to have longer um, shocks and more shocks, and now they don't. So the more shocks that someone gets and the longer those shocks are can actually cause brain damage. So they do shorter shock waves, lower waves, and they will do fewer treatments than they did in the past. Most patients report some type of memory loss that can happen, but it can lead to improvement in self-reported uh, cases up to 60 to 80%. And that vagus nerve stimulation, this is a, a primary communication link between the brain and the major organs, especially if there's an issue with a spinal cord based injury. So there might be a severance of the spinal cord. That's where the vagus nerve will come in. So there's an implanted pulse generator that is placed on the vagus nerve that will send electrical signals from the vagus nerve to stimulate the brain. And the positive effects of the vagus nerve stimulation are achieved um, very similar to ECT, but without ECT's uh, negative side effects or trauma. And many clients report significant relief. This is what the vagus nerve um, stimulation will look like, and then they send pulses to the brain. And then the, by doing this, it helps to reduce depression in clients. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, as I just talked about, it's a coil that's placed on or above the patient's head and sends magnetic currents into the individual's brain. It helps to increase neuron activity, especially in the prefrontal cortex, and it helps to improve the function through the brain's depression-related circuit. This typically will reduce depression um, longer term when it's administered daily for four to six weeks. And then um, with brain stimulation, this was an experimental treatment in which electrodes are implanted in a key component of the depression related brains, typically the subgenial cingulate and attached to a battery. And there's repeated stimulation that reduces the structural activity to a normal level and helps to recalibrate the brain circuit. It's been helpful with a number of those who have major depressive disorder that did not respond to other treatments. So how do the treatments for unipolar depression actually compare? Well, you see that right here. Something to think about is that unipolar depression is one of the most treatable kinds of depression. But by using these different therapies, you can find that they're going to have different rates of effectiveness. So uh, CBT, interpersonal biological therapies, when used together are 
um, effective for unipolar depression. Cognitive behavioral and interpersonal therapies have a lower relapse likelihood, but are not relapse proof. There's really nothing that's relapse proof. And couples therapy is effective when people with unipolar depression experience significant marital discord as well. When you look at the psychodynamic therapies, they're less effective than cognitive behavioral or interpersonal therapies. The combination of psychotherapy and drug therapy is more helpful than either alone, and that's why it's used so much today. The outcomes don't always carry over to the treatment of depressed children and adolescents, but it can help for adults. When we look at biological treatments, ECT appears to be more effective than, um, than the uh, deep brain stimulation or the transcranial, um, what do you call it, than the, uh, the vagus nerve stimulation or the transmagnetic stimulation where they put that on the uh, brain. So when selecting a biological treatment for mild to severe unipolar depression, clinicians are more likely going to look at not only um, psychotherapy, but using antidepressant drugs, then going to more um, biological treatments. Now let's switch to treatments for bipolar disorder. So before 1970, treatments with, for bipolar disorder were largely ineffective. They actually didn't affect it at all. Um, in many cases, because there was a lack of effectiveness, you found that a large number of individuals who had bipolar disorder were put into um, institutions and they really never came out. In 1970, the Food and Drug Administration approved the use of lithium. This is a metallic element that occurs in nature as a mineral salt, and it's very effective for those who have bipolar disorder. They also introduced mood stabilizing or anti-bipolar drugs in the 80s and 90s. These are mood stabilizing drugs or psychotropic drugs that help to stimulate the moods of people suffering from bipolar disorder. And again, it's known as an anti-bipolar drug. When we think about lithium, it's very effective, but to find the right dosage, it takes a lot. So when it's too low, there's no effect. And when it's too high, it can cause lithium intoxication or poisoning and can actually impact the functioning of one's kidneys. So typically with lithium, you find that you have to uh, start off the lowest dose and you increase it every two to three weeks. And an individual either every two to four weeks or whenever a dosage is upped has to go have their kidney levels checked to make sure that their kidneys are not in fact failing. About 49% of all people with bipolar disorder receive treatments in any given year. Understand though too, that many people who have bipolar disorder will start treatment and then stop treatment because the side effects of um, anti-bipolar medications, especially lithium, can be pretty jarring, especially if they end up getting lithium intoxication. And it also dulls them to the point that they don't feel alive anymore or they don't feel like they have really much to um, live for, not that they're suicidal, but they lack their creativity. They lack a spark. They, you know, may have had some of their more effective moments when they were in mania and now they don't have that. So they're not as productive as they once were. There are also, when you look at the other mood stabilizers, there are some patients that respond better to other drugs or other combination of drugs than going on lithium. So the effectiveness in lithium of other mood stabilizers is that they can help more than 60% of patients with mania improve on these medications. Many individuals experience fewer new episodes while they're on drugs, so they're not going to cycle as much or not cycle as frequently. And these medications can also help to prevent symptoms from developing. Mood stabilizers also help those who have bipolar disorder overcome their depressive episodes or to a lesser degree. So given the drug's less powerful impact on depressive moods, many clinicians will use that combination of a mood stabilizer and antidepressant drugs to treat bipolar depression, even though the research suggests that antidepressants may trigger manic episodes in some patients. The side effects are just a lot less than something like lithium. Although antidepressant drugs offer a neuron's initial reception of neurotransmitters, mood stabilizers seem to affect a neuron's second messengers. So by utilizing a mood stabilizer with an antidepressant, it's going to be able to do a lot more with a lot less side effects. 
Still though, researchers don't fully understand how mood stabilizing drugs really operate. So the theories that they have are listed here, but again, they seem to affect the neurons second messengers. So using a mood stabilizer in addition to an antidepressant, because the antidepressant affects the initial reception of the neurotransmitter can help in longer term support those who have bipolar disorder. And finally, we have adjunctive therapy. This is psychotherapy or mood stabilizing alone, right? This is rarely helpful. So by using adjunctive therapy, we're using individual therapy, group therapy, mood stabilizing drugs, and an antidepressant together, this can certainly help the entire person. And by helping them, you are going to help them with individual therapy going through their personal stressors, group therapy, working on things like um, working through things like um, communication issues, social skills, barriers, um, and making sure that they tend to their ADLs or activities of daily living. By using group, uh, excuse me, family therapy, because the individual with bipolar has impacted the family, you can work through some of those stressors as a family. And then again, in individual therapy, continue to work through any of those things that might have a residual effect on the individual. By using antidepressants, you are, um, you are affecting the initial reception of the neurotransmitter. By using a mood stabilizer, it's the second set of messengers. By using lithium, you have that as an, and as an encompassed all in one rather than using antidepressants or, uh, or antidepressants and a mood stabilizer. So, by using a combination of therapies, it helps to improve a variety of client behaviors, and especially those who have sigmatic disorder. 30% or more of patients with these disorders may not respond to lithium or related drugs. They may not receive the proper dose, they may relapse while taking it, or they may stop taking their medications altogether. So adjunctive therapy overall will help to improve client adherence to medication regimen, reduce hospitalization, improve social functioning, and increase the ability to do things like obtain and hold a job. I hope that this was helpful. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to reach out to me via email. Also, don't forget in the description box below is this week's extra credit question. All you need to do is uh, answer the question in the comment section, take a screenshot and upload it to Canvas for up to one point added to your final grade. Until next time, I hope you have a great one and be well.